Welcome to Physical Chemistry 2 uh, Thermodynamics. In today's lecture, we'll be looking at the chemical potential yeah, of a pure phase and mixed phase systems. Um, and we will learn a little bit more about the uh, significance of a chemical potential. Okay, so we will first deal with uh, systems yeah, in which there is an equilibrium between a mixed phase and a pure phase. Yeah? So the mass transfer from one, from one phase to the other uh, in, in such a case is limited to one substance only. Yeah? And we only need to consider the equilibrium condition for this one substance. Yeah? This is true, yeah? for example, when we dissolve salt yeah, in a solvent, for example, water. Yeah? And we consider the equilibrium between the solution yeah? And the vapor phase. Yeah. So in the following um, in the following slides, we will always refer to the solvent yeah, with index one and the solute with index two. Yeah. And we will also refer to the phase yeah, stable at lower temperatures as alpha and the phase stable at higher temperatures as beta. So we start out by investigating a two-phase system. Yeah, it consists uh, of a solution yeah, and a vapor phase. Yeah? And that vapor phase contains only the solvent. Yeah? So this means we've got two components yeah, and two phases. Now if we apply uh, Gibbs phase rule yeah, that we have established previously, yeah, we get two degrees of freedom yeah, if we exclude any chemical reactions between the solute and solvent. Yeah? So now um, if we choose a certain temperature T yeah, and the mole fraction of a solute as X2, yeah, then X1 is uh, automatically given yeah, because we know that the sum over all Xi yeah, is equal to 1. Yeah? So same will go for the pressure. Yeah? It is fixed by the two quantities uh, X2 and T. Okay, so now uh, we said previously the mass transfer uh, between the phases is limited to the solvent. Yeah, so we can restrict ourselves to component one. Yeah, so let's apply now the equilibrium condition here in equation 3.7. Yeah, that the chemical potential is the same everywhere. Yeah, uh, so we learned about this in lecture five. If you want to refer back in your notes. Yeah, so we get our equation 5.1. Yeah, so mu1 alpha is equal mu1 beta. Yeah, well, what does this mean? Well, we know uh, that the alpha phase here, yeah, which is our solution, is a mixed phase. Yeah, so that means the chemical potential of a solvent is lowered compared to that of a pure solvent. Yeah, and it's lowered by the amount RT uh, uh, log of F1 times X1. Yeah, as we see here in equation 5.2. Yeah. So now we assume a real solution in this case, yeah, and therefore we replace uh, the mole fraction here um, uh, of a solvent by the activity, yeah, A1. And A1 is F1 times X1. Yeah. So um, mu star. Uh, one alpha yeah, is a concentration independent chemical potential of a pure solvent at the same pressure and temperature as in the mixed phase. Yeah? And uh, vapor phase um, is also a pure, pure phase, as we said. Yeah? So that means uh, uh, mu one beta in equation 5.1 is identical to the chemical potential of a pure phase, yeah, and this gives us here equation 5.3, yeah. So mu one beta is equal to mu one uh, star beta, yeah. So now let's plug uh, in our result here from equation 5.3 and 5.2, yeah, into equation 5.1, yeah? and we get an expression um, uh, for of the equilibrium condition, yeah, in terms of standard chemical potentials yeah so uh, mu one star alpha yeah, which is a standard chemical potential um, plus rt uh, log uh, a1 yeah equals mu one star beta 
Yeah, so what do we learn from this equation? Well, we see that the chemical potential of a solvent in the solution yeah, is smaller than in the pure solvent. Yeah? And the chemical potential in the vapor phase above a solution must also be smaller. Yeah? So we now want to look at how the vapor pressure changes when we change the concentration of a solute yeah, at, a, at a constant temperature T. Yeah? So we again ask for the equilibrium condition here in equation 5.5. Yeah, d mu 1 star alpha plus d rt ln a1 at equilibrium must be equal to d mu 1 star beta. Yeah, since we want uh, to keep the temperature constant, yeah, uh, we only need to consider the pressure dependent terms yeah, um, when we substitute uh, uh, later for d mu 1 star. Yeah, uh, d mu 1 star alpha 1. Yeah? Uh, so we get our equation 5.6 here by just plugging this in. Yeah? Um, so now we can replace the partial uh, differential quotients which we have here yeah, by the molar volumes. Yeah? We obtain for the concentration dependence of a vapor pressure at constant temperature. Yeah? And this will give us our equation 5.7. Yeah, so remember the substitution we're doing here from lecture seven. Yeah, so the differential quotients we're using here can be derived, yeah, like all other quantities from the co uh, four characteristic functions. Yeah, so we get here v uh, v one star beta minus v one star alpha dp equals R T D L N A one at uh, constant temperature. Yeah, and uh, we can solve this. Now, yeah, as uh, uh, delta P over delta ln A1 at constant temperature equals RT over V1 star beta minus V1 star alpha. Right, now let's look at the equation at 5.8. Yeah? The denominator here on the right hand side, yeah, what is this equal to? Well, it's equal to the difference in the molar volumes yeah, of a pure solvent in the vapor state beta yeah, and in the liquid state alpha. Yeah, what do we know by this? Uh, or, or what do we know from this? Well, we know that volume in the, um, uh, in the vapor state beta yeah, must be much, much larger than the volume in the liquid state alpha. Yeah, so we can simply neglect this uh, v1 star alpha term here yeah and finally we can then uh, substitute the molar volume of a vapor phase according to the ideal gas equation yeah by p and t yeah so this is exactly what we've done here yeah so we just plug in here uh, for this uh, volume one star beta yeah we plug in our, uh, our relationship pv equals uh, nrt here uh, uh, and since we're dealing essentially with normalized quantities, yeah, the R terms get eliminated, uh, the T terms get eliminated, and we're just left with P. Yeah, so this will give us here our equation 5.9 yeah, as, as a much simpler relationship. Yeah, and we can solve this now. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, D L N P equals D L N L uh, A1. Yeah, so our equation 5.10. So we are now interested in the change um, in the pressure yeah, um, that results from the addition of solute to the pure solvent. Yeah? So we must integrate equation 510. And uh, what limits are we choosing? Well, the limits are set by the pure solvent. Yeah? P1 equals P star 1 and A1 equals 1. Yeah? And the other limit is given by the uh, corresponding solution. Yeah, and the, this is P1 and A1. Yeah, so for this integration, we get our equation 512. Yeah, so this is ln uh, P1 over P1 star equals ln A1. Yeah, and this solves uh, when we plug in for A1 uh, equals F1 times X1. Yeah, this solves this equation 513. Yeah, so we essentially get uh, P1 over P1 star equals A1 
equals f1 times x1. Yeah. So we learn from this equation yeah, that we can determine um, activities yeah, or activity coefficients f1 uh, from the measurement of vapor pressure. Now that's great yeah, because this will come in handy. Um, okay, so now let's uh, assume yeah, that we, if we have a sufficiently dilute, dilute solution, yeah, then the uh, this, this activity coefficient f1 approaches 1. Yeah, so we can replace uh, the activity uh, A1 yeah, simply by the mole fraction X1 or X2, yeah, depending on which, uh, what we're looking at. Yeah? So we essentially then get P1 over P1 star equals X1 equals 1 minus X2. Yeah? And this is really an important equation yeah, because it describes the relative reduction in the vapor pressure of a solvent. Yeah? And this relative reduction you know, or depression uh, of vapor pressure of a solvent is equal to the mole fraction of a solute. Yeah? And this law was uh, empirically found by uh, François-Marie Raoul yeah, in 1890. And uh, you should note essentially that the extent of vapor pressure reduction here, yeah, which is formulated here in Rolle's uh, law, um, depends only on the mole fraction of a solute X2, yeah, and not on the chemical nature of a solute. Yeah? So we can just quickly jot this down. Yeah? So the this uh, uh, vapor pressure P yeah, is proportional only to X. Yeah? So this is essentially what, what is described by colligative property. Yeah? And we will learn about other phenomena yeah, in the following slides that depend also only on the particle number of a solute X2. Yeah? And these properties, like I said, they are called colligative properties. Yeah, and on the following slides, we will see uh, that uh, the reduction of the chemical potential of a solvent yeah, uh, is also a result yeah, of a presence of solute. Yeah? And the sentence pretty much encapsulates uh, um, yeah, what is meant by colligative pr uh, properties. Yeah? So if a, if a solute is now um, a salt in solution, yeah, then both uh, the cations and anions will contribute to the particle number. Yeah? So it means uh, one mole of a monovalent completely dissociated electrolyte uh, decreases the vapor pressure yeah, twice as much as one mole of a non-dissociated sub substance. Yeah? So when we're calculating the mole fraction here, yeah, we must consider dissociation yeah, and of course association if it's happening of a solute. Yeah? So this will contribute here in this equation. Yeah? And the figure on the left hand side uh, shows us pretty much the case of a non-dissociating solute. Yeah? So this is glucose. Um, uh, the vapor pressure of a glucose solution um, and we can see clearly uh, that Raoult's law um, holds true for very dilute solutions. Yeah? So uh, the measured values deviate from uh, Raoult's straight line yeah? um, already at relatively low concentrations yeah? and deviations from this ideal behavior uh, will of course also exist in the gas phase, yeah, as we will see in the following. Um, and in this case, uh, the pressures must be replaced by fugacities yeah, that we learned about earlier in the course. So let's look at uh, Raoult's law in action. Yeah, so what we can get out of this, um, well, it means that uh, if we measure the vapor pressure reduction, yeah, we can determine the mole fraction x2, yeah, and uh, then using Rolle's law, uh, we can also easily obtain the amount of substance, yeah, n2, yeah, and n2 
is essentially this quotient here of the weight m2 yeah divided by the molar mass big m2 yeah so again looking at equation 5.15 we know that the um, depression you yeah, have a relative depression of a vapor pressure yeah for a solution of a certain concentration is constant yeah means it's equal to x2 yeah and the absolute um, vapor depression yeah p star 1 minus p1 um, is therefore proportional to the vapor pressure yeah so this means uh, that the vapor pressure curve of a solution yeah, it's always below that of a solvent. Yeah, it also means that with decreasing temperature, yeah, the distance between the two curves decreases. Yeah, as we schematically see here in this figure. Now, the lowering of vapor pressure here, yeah, has two consequences. Yeah, so for example, the steam pressure, yeah, of uh, 1.013 bar um, is only reached at a higher temperature, yeah, the moment that we have a solute present. Yeah? This means that the boiling point yeah, of a solution is also at a higher temperature yeah, than in the, in the pure solvent. So here you have this, yeah? so this is essentially the boiling point uh, of our solution, yeah? somewhat higher than for the pure solvent. Yeah? And secondly, yeah, the vapor pressure curve um, of a solution here um, intersects uh, the sublimation pressure curve yeah, of a solvent at lower temperature. Yeah? So this temperature is lower than the triple point of a solvent. Yeah? So now let's assume that the pure solvent freezes when the solution cools down. Yeah? This means that the freezing point of a solution is lower than that of a solvent. Yeah, this applies, for example, for salt and water. Yeah, and we use that principle on our highways uh, when they are frozen over in winter. Yeah. Yeah, but this uh, this principle doesn't need to apply necessarily. Yeah, if we have a case where the solute precipitates during cooling, so uh, be mindful of a problem set. So remember how we de derived Raoult's law. Yeah, we've established. But according to the phase rule, yeah, we've got two freedoms for a two-phase, two-component system. Yeah? So that means by choosing the mole fraction and the temperature, we determine the pressure. Yeah? Uh, this also means that uh, for constant temperature, yeah, um, we can then calculate the pressure as a function of a mole fraction. Yeah? In the same way, we can determine the temperature yeah, as a function of a mole fraction and pressure. Yeah, we can therefore consider here these equilibrium conditions um, at constant pressure yeah, and calculate the boiling point of a melting point as a function of a mole fraction. Yeah, how would this work in practice? Well, we could again write down our equations 5.1 uh, all the way to 5.5 um, and then substitute uh, yeah, our d mu, yeah, with the total differentials that are temperature dependent, yeah, since dp equals zero, yeah, so here. Um, but we can get there faster, yeah, if we express the equilibrium conditions uh, with a Planck function, yeah, y equals minus gt, g over t, sorry. Yeah, uh, remember the Planck function, we introduced it very briefly in the summary slide in lecture seven, yeah. So for an equilibrium, uh, essentially between uh, phase alpha, yeah, stable at lower temperature, and the pure vapor phase beta, stable at higher temperature, um, we get the equivalent equilibrium conditions yeah, at constant pressure. Yeah? So essentially these are all equivalent to each other. Um, yeah, 5.16 all the way to 5.20. So these are the equivalencies here. Uh, and now remember our characteristic functions. Yeah, we can get the free enthalpy little h into our equ equation here. Yeah, um, and at constant pr uh, constant pressure, yeah, uh, we finally get here our equation 5.21.
yeah, is minus h1 star alpha over t squared dt uh, plus r dln a1 equals minus h1 star beta over t squared dt. Yeah, and from this we can get the concentration dependence uh, of a temperature at a given pressure. Yeah, so this is here our equation 5.22. Yeah, uh, delta T over delta ln A1 at constant pressure equals RT squared over H1 star alpha minus H1 star beta. Yeah. So now the boiling process is essentially a transition from the phase alpha into the phase beta. Yeah? So it means, uh, therefore, uh, H1 star beta yeah, minus H1 star alpha corresponds to the enthalpy of vaporization. Yeah? We want to obtain the boiling point increase now as a function of concentration. Yeah? So we must uh, integrate here our equation 5.23. Yeah? And we do this yeah, as in the case for vapor pressure depression yeah, between um, the following states yeah, of a pure solvent. Yeah, so this, uh, here in this case the limit would be T equals T S star and A1 equals 1. Yeah, and the corresponding limit for the solution. Yeah, so in the, in the solution we've got temperature equals T S and yeah, some a1 yeah so these are the limits we integrate between yeah so we get here our equation 5.24 so now it is easier to perform this integration yeah if we assume that the enthalpy of vaporization yeah delta uh, um, vh uh, and the activity coefficient a1 are independent of temperature yeah so then we obtain when we do the integration here, our equation 5.25, yeah, delta VH over R times, in brackets, 1 over TS minus 1 over TS star equals ln A1. Yeah, so what do we learn from this equation? Well, first we note uh, that the activity coefficient A1 yeah, must be smaller than 1. Yeah, so the expression uh, 1 over Ts minus 1 over Ts star must be negative. Yeah? And this, of course, apply, uh, implies uh, that Ts is larger than Ts star. Yeah? So this is the observation yeah, that, we, that we saw previously in the diagram um, uh, yeah, of our boiling point increase. Yeah? And we saw that yeah, on slide six. So if we restrict ourselves again uh, to ideally dilute solutions, yeah, um, we may replace the activity coefficient A1, uh, uh, so the activity A1 yeah, by the mole fraction X1 times the activity coefficient F1. Yeah? And for ln A1, we can write ln 1 minus x2. Yeah, so we can plug this in here. Now this is uh, uh, this expression ln 1 minus x2 uh, can now be developed into a series. Yeah, so uh, this is essentially if we just deconvolute that this is essentially minus x2 minus half x2 squared minus a third x2 to the power of 3 and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, and we can break this series off pretty much after the first member. Yeah, um, remember we're dealing with a dilute solution. Yeah, so x2 is very very small. Yeah, so now we can simply substitute this in. Yeah, and we get our expression 5 to uh, 526. Yeah, and we solve for the boiling point increase. Yeah, and we get our expression 527. Yeah. So just as in the case for a vapor pressure depression, we see from this equation yeah, that the boiling point increase yeah, uh, in a given solvent depends only on the mole fraction x2. 
and it does not depend on the chemical nature of a solute. And like so, the elevation of a boiling point is also one of the colligative properties. So we will now look at the uh, depression of a melting point. Yeah? So let's again note that during melting or freezing, yeah, there is an equilibrium between uh, the solution phase beta, yeah, which is stable at higher temperature, and the pure solid phase alpha, which is stable at lower temperature. Yeah? All previous equations we looked at must retain their validity, yeah? even if we interchange alpha and beta. So uh, we get our equation 528, yeah, um, and uh, we find that H star, uh, H1 star beta minus H1 star alpha, yeah, must be the enthalpy of fusion, yeah, delta MH of a solvent, yeah. So we plug this in and we get our equation 529. So now we perform the integration between the states of a pure solvent again, yeah. So this is given by uh, uh, T equals T M star and A1 equals one, yeah, and the solution, yeah. So T equals T M and A1 is some value, yeah. Uh, same as in the case of the uh, uh, elevation of a boiling point of the last slide, yeah. And we finally obtain um, an, uh, an expression for the, for the depression of a melting point, yeah as equation 530. Yeah? So Tm minus Tm star equals minus Rtm star squared over uh, the uh, enthalpy of fusion of solvent yeah? times x2. Yeah? And again we note yeah, that the observed effect here, yeah, the pressure, uh, uh, elevation of a melting point uh, depends only on the mole fraction of a solute X2, yeah, and not on its chemical nature. And as mentioned earlier, yeah, when we discuss vapor pressure depression, we have to account for dissociation and association, yeah, when counting the mole fractions. Yeah, so as an example, yeah, when an electrolyte uh, dissociates, yeah, the cations and anions count as independent particles, yeah. And this relationship here yeah, for the melting point decrease is illustrated in the figure above. Yeah. Here the melting points uh, of diluted dextrose solutions yeah, and potassium chloride um, solutions are compared with the calculated straight lines. Yeah. So the melting points uh, of the dextrose solutions correspond very closely to those calculated. Yeah. So you see hardly any deviation yeah so this is essentially dextrose doesn't uh, doesn't dissociate in solution yeah so if it is uh, if it is very good yeah and for the melting points of potassium chloride solutions uh, um, yeah we get an approximate correspondence yeah so there is some uh, why is this yeah because KCl is probably not fully dissociated so there is some uh, there is something else going on here, and in the later parts of the course we will uh, we will look at this. So on the previous slides we saw that uh, going from equation 525 all the way to 530, yeah, we made a set of assumptions. Yeah, we get this proportionality, yeah, of um, the uh, depression of boiling point or the elevation of a melting point. Uh, with a mole fraction x2, yeah, only in very dilute sol ideal solutions. Yeah? And working under these assumptions, um, we find uh, that the fraction yeah, of a melting point of a boiling point squared yeah, times the fraction of the enthalpy of vaporization over the enthalpy of fusion yeah, is always larger than one. Yeah? So for solutions, of the same concentration, yeah, the absolute melting point depression yeah, is larger than the uh, absolute boiling point increase. Yeah, and people realize this relationship and put it for ease of calculations into so-called ebullioscopic constants and uh, cryoscopic constants, yeah, which you will find in literature and in tables. Yeah, and this comes from the Latin ebulire, yeah, to boil, 
and cryoscopic uh, uh, yeah, and to freeze. Yeah. So these constants um, are essentially the quotient yeah, of the limit value of a boiling point increase yeah, of a melting point decrease extrapolated to infinite dilution yeah, and the molality of a solution. Yeah, now remember, molality is essentially moles per mass, while the molarity is moles per volume. So let's look at these um, constants uh, um, in an example. Yeah, we have essentially m2 mole yeah, of a substance dissolved in one kilogram of solvent. Yeah, so this is again for historical uh, reasons. This this was always given as a molality. Yeah, so we get then essentially our equations 5.31 and 5.32. So x2 equals n2 over n1 plus n2 equals n2 over m1, yeah, the, mass, uh, the molar mass of the substance 1, yeah, plus n2 equals big M1 times n2 over yeah, 1 kilogram of solvent plus m1 times n2. Yeah, and we can uh, well then essentially simplify this. Yeah, so x2 equals m1 times m2. Yeah, over one plus m, big M1 times m2. Yeah, where uh, m1 is a mass of a solvent. Yeah, here in this case, in this example, one kilogram. Big M1 is a molar mass of a solvent. Yeah, and small m2 is the molality of a solute. Yeah. So now remember uh, these, uh, yeah, our assumption, yeah. So we are working at a very strong dilution, yeah. So that means uh, big M1 times M2 is much much smaller than one, yeah. And we get then for the uh, mole fraction x2, yeah, that it is approximately equal to the molar mass um, of a solvent times the molality of a solute. Yeah, so this is here our equation 533. Now let's plug this uh, into our relationship, uh, this relationship into our expression yeah, for the elevation uh, uh, of, uh, of a boiling point yeah, and the depression of a melting point. Yeah, so we get uh, our corresponding uh, equations here. Yeah, now the uh, factor yeah, which I marked here in red and in blue yeah, just before M2, yeah, this is the ebullioscopic constant, yeah, marked here in red, yeah, all of these things are constant at a given, um, at a given uh, uh, temperature, uh, uh, yeah, all of these things are essentially constant in a given experimental set, yeah, and uh, here in blue we've got the cryoscopic constant. Yeah, and the uh, table here on the right gives you a comparison of these constants for a number of yeah, inorganic and organic solvents. Yeah? And you can immediately see from this yeah, how uh, useful such tables are. Yeah? As they really simplify our calculations of uh, boiling and melting point elevations and depressions when we just plug these in. Okay, and this brings us to the end of this lecture. Next time around, uh, we'll be looking at osmotic pressure.